concepts of weak solutions to the, to the equations. Um, and these weak solutions will belong to function spaces, that's sets of functions with a certain kind of regularity that, that allow a certain kind of singularity. And these, these function spaces have to be large enough to describe the singularities. And one, one sort of message is that the function space then becomes part of the model. We'll, we'll see this as, as I go along. Okay, so now turning to uh, solid crystals, I'm going to talk about microstructure in martensitic phase transformation. So what are they? Well, they're, they're um, phase transformations which involve a change of shape of the underlying uh, crystal lattice at a uh, critical uh, temperature. So for example, you might have a, a, a crystal which at a high temperature has a cubic lattice. So there might be, so there, there you see an elementary um, cube of the lattice. So there might be, say, an atom at each corner and in the middle of each face. That would be a face-centered cubic lattice because it forms a, it's repeated many times to form a very big lattice. So that's at the high temperature. And then you, then you reduce the temperature to below this critical temperature, theta critical. And, uh, and then due to energetic you know, interactions between the atoms and so on, uh, the, um, the, 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 the crystal wants to change its shape. So in this case, it goes, the cube uh, is changed to a, to a tetragon. That's a, a brick-like object which has two sides equal and one side different. And because the whole situation has cubic symmetry, if it, if it wants to stretch in the, say, the horizontal direction to form, to form a, a tetragon as shown in blue there, also equally it might want to stretch in the other two cubic directions. So in this case you get three so-called variants, tetragonal variants of the low temperature phase. So the high, the high temperature phase is called austenite and the low temperature phase is called martensite. So there can be a different kind of change of symmetry. For example, it could be cubic to orthorhombic. So in this case, the change of symmetry involves stretching in one cubic direction and then in, in two face diagonal directions. So you have one choice for the, for the, for the, for the, for the cubic direction and then two choices because you can swap the amounts of stretch in the, in the face diagonals. And that, so, so for a cubic to orthorhombic transformation, you get six orthorhombic uh, variants of the low temperature phase. So a good model for this is uh, nonlinear elasticity. And so that uh, seeks to represent and have a free energy, which at temperature theta uh, is, a, is an integral over some uh, region, omega, occupied by the crystal of a free energy density that depends on the gradient of the deformation y. So y of x is the deformed position of the particle of, that is at x in the reference configuration. And so it makes sense to look for the, so remember the dy of x is in this case a 3 by 3 matrix. So it makes sense to, to look at the set uh, of matrices that minimize uh, the integrand, the free energy density, at temperature theta. So I denote by M3 cross 3 plus 3 by 3 matrices with positive determinant. We have positive determinant to make sure that the material doesn't reflect itself or crush down to, to zero volume. When you look at temperature theta at the set of deformation gradients, set of matrices A that minimize this free energy density. And we represent the the phase transformation in the following way that looks a little bit complicated at, at first sight. So the way to understand this is, is to look at the middle line when theta is equal to theta critical. Then the high temperature phase and the low temperature phase should have the same energy. So the, the, we take as the reference configuration the high temperature phase at the critical temperature. So, one, so that's represented by the mapping y of x is equal to x whose gradient is the identity matrix. And so the identity matrix, therefore, should belong to k theta critical, k theta, where theta is equal to theta critical. But the energy is invariant to rotating, uh, the, rotating the crystal by a rigid 
rotation. So you also have um, any rotation. So SO3 denotes the set of, uh, of rotation matrices. So that SO3 then represents the, the energy well corresponding to the austenite at the critical temperature. And then, uh, looking further to, to the right in that middle line, uh, we have um, a finite number of uh, variants represented by positive definite symmetric matrices UI. And you can rotate each of those as well. So, um, so, so at theta critical, then, you have uh, n energy wells corresponding to the n variants of the low temperature phase and, and one energy well corresponding to the, to the high temperature phase. And then when theta is bigger than theta critical, you want the high temperature phase to minimize the energy. And so the, 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 this set K theta is just rotations multiplied by some thermal expansion coefficient alpha of theta. And below the uh, critical temperature, you want the martensite energy wells to, to minimize the energy. So um, you just have those, that, that the union of SO3 UI of theta. So you, these positive definite symmetric matrices which give the change of shape of the lattice, um, they, they depend on temperature. So for a cubic tetragonal um, uh, transformation, N is three, there are three variants, and, and you can represent the three matrices U1, U2, and U3 by these diagonal matrices. So you see that there's two parameters, A to one, A to one, A to one, and A to two, and the fact that you have diagonal A to two, A to one, A to one is telling you that is transforming a cube into a tetragon. Okay, and then you permute, you, you put the eta two in different places to get the other two variants. And if it was cubic to orthorhombic, n would be six, and you would have six more complicated looking matrices that uh, give the, the change of shape. Now, in, in, uh, in these materials, in fact, I already showed you a micrograph where we saw lots of interfaces. So it's important to understand how to describe interfaces. And so here is the, uh, the, the basic calculation. You imagine that you've got a, a, a mapping Y which is piecewise affine. It's continuous, but its gradient jumps across some surface. That surface has normal uh, capital N, and above the surface, the gradient is a constant matrix A, and below the surface, it's another constant matrix B. Okay, so the question is, how are A and B related? And the answer is given by this formula that A minus B has to be the tensor product of a vector A with the normal N. And that's the so-called Hadamard jump condition. And it just comes from uh, applying continuity across the plane. So A tensor N, that's the matrix whose components are A, I, N, J. So, so then to look at, so in, 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 in K of theta, you see all these energy wells of the form SO3 times something. So can we find pairs of matrices belonging to these energy wells which satisfy uh, this Hadamard jump condition? And so there's a little theorem that uh, is proved in many different versions in, in the literature. So here's one version. So if you've got two positive definite symmetric matrices, U and V, which are different, then there's a rank one connection. So, a, so the tensor product of two vectors is, is a rank one matrix, assuming that, those, the, that A is different from B. And so there's a rank one connection between two energy wells, SO3 and SO, SO3U and SO3V. That means that you can find one matrix say RU on SO3U and one matrix R tilde V on SO3V that differ by a matrix of rank one for some rotations R and R tilde and some vectors A and N if and only if, you can do that, if and only if the middle eigenvalue of U squared minus V squared is zero. So U squared minus V squared is a symmetric three by three matrix. It has three eigenvalues. You can order them and to get an interface, the middle eigenvalue has to be zero. So, now it turns out that, that you cannot find two matrices on the same energy well that differ by a matrix of rank one. So you can't make an interface between two matrices on the same energy well. But if you take two of the 
low temperature uh, energy wells, two of the variants, SO3UI and say SO3UJ, then it may be possible to, um, to have uh, rank one connections between them. And if so, the corresponding interfaces are called twins. And uh, they have two possible perpendicular um, normals. And so here's a picture. This is a high resolution electron micrograph of twins in nickel manganese that does a, a, a cubic to tetragonal transformation. And the, the cubic axes are as shown at 45 degrees to the, uh, to the horizontal, and the other one is into the, into the middle of the screen. And if you look very carefully, so each dot represents a column of atoms perpendicular to the screen. And if you look very carefully, you see on the right uh, how the atoms are. So these, in, these interfaces, um, which, uh, which separate these layers, um, on, on, on one side, it's been stretched in one of the cubic directions, and on the other side, in the other cubic direction. So in this case, this is face-centered cubic, which is why you see a dot in the middle of the, of the, um, the four other dots. So and one, one thing that I want to notice here is that you do have this, these layers exist, and they're very, very fine. So they're just six or ten atomic spacings thick. Now, again, by the theorem, there's a rank one connection between the austenite, that's represented by SO3, and SO3UI, if and only if. So now I've got U is UI, and V is, say, the identity. So I need that the, mid, that the middle eigenvalue of, of u squared minus the identity is zero. So that's saying that the middle eigenvalue of ui, lambda 2 of ui, is 1. So that's something that you don't expect to happen. I mean, you never, I mean, ui is some matrix. It's very unlikely that its middle eigenvalue is exactly 1. So usually it's not 1. And so you can't make an interface between the high temperature phase and the low temperature phase. So how does it get from the high temperature phase to the low temperature phase? Well, this is typically how it does it. So the high temperature phase is on the right, and on the left, you see that it does it by making this very fine laminate in which you have uh, uh, twins. So in these, in these layers, the, the gradient alternates between two values, A and B. And in fact, uh, this is one of the interesting sort of philosophical things about this theory that the, the minimum of the energy in this model is in general not attained. In other words, it's, the energy is bounded below by something, so you apply some boundary conditions, the energy is bounded below by some number, and you can find a configuration that gets you as close as you like to this number, but you will never actually get there. Right? And as you get closer and closer, the microstructure becomes finer and finer. These layers become closer and closer together. So that according to the model, you get infinitely fine microstructures. So in some sense, uh, these very fine microstructures that you see come in this model, are predicted in this model uh, because of this uh, phenomenon. OK, now to understand more complicated microstructures requires advanced techniques of the calculus of variations, such as quasi-convexity and young measures. And there are many unsolved questions. So I'm going to just show you some pictures. So here are some pictures of the kind of complicated microstructures that uh, you can see. So in, in orange there, this is, this is a copper, aluminum, nickel. We saw one like that before. Then on the right in, in these various colors is copper, zinc, aluminum. Here we see uh, in nickel, aluminum in the bottom left, we see two families of layers in different directions that meet. And uh, on, the, on the right, it's not so easy to see. This is, these are all single crystals, so, but often materials form polycrystals in which there are grains in which the orientation of the crystal are different. And then we see uh, sort of microstructures that occur in one grain and then affect the microstructure in different grains. So we can't understand many of these pictures precisely because we don't understand some fundamental issues of the, of the calculus of variations. So rather than try to, because I don't have time to describe some of that, I just want to show you 
some interesting pictures and, 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 a vi and two videos, actually, um, of things that uh, are related to, to, to what I've done. And um, so the first one is this. This is um, a so-called non-classical austenite multi-site interfaces that was predicted many years ago by uh, a collaborator of mine, Carsten Carstensen, and myself. And then this very brilliant um, exper young experimentalist, Hannah Scheiner from Czech Republic, Czech Republic, found a wonderful way of producing these. So in this case, whereas we saw uh, um, a classical austenite martensite interface in which there was a, a, sing a, a, a simple layering which matched onto the austenite, here there are layers within layers. There are double sort of layers. Okay, so this was predicted by theory. Now, uh, Hanna Scheiner has another fantastic experiment which I, want, which I want to show you. So this is a single crystal of um, copper, aluminum, nickel, and it's in the low temperature phase. It has a constant deformation gradient. And that black thing in the middle is, is, is the tip of a soldering iron. So it's very, very hot. So at the tip of the soldering iron, the temperature is way above theta critical. So you would expect that the, the high temperature phase would nucleate underneath the tip of the soldering iron. But it doesn't do that. It, 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 will, it nucleates at the bottom right-hand corner of the, of the specimen. So if you look carefully, as I run the video, you'll see that happening, I hope. Except that it doesn't. Oh, no, no, no. That's, no. So where is the, why doesn't that work? There we go. Okay, maybe I, I try and show it again. Um, so it stops at the, it starts at the bottom right hand corner. I hope I can make it work again. No, maybe I, there we go. So why is that? It's because you can't, it, it's a question of geometry. You cannot fit the high temperature phase onto the low temperature phase in the middle of the specimen, or on a surface, or on one of the edges. But it's possible to do so at a corner. So it's, really, it's an interesting kind of phenomenon. Now, and finally I wanted to show you uh, in this section a very interesting recent sort of set of discoveries. It's by one of my collaborators, uh, Dick James, and in, in some sense it comes from some of my early work with him. So, what he did had the brilliant idea of constructing a material which satisfied this condition that the middle eigenvalue of UI was 1. Of course, you can't make it exactly 1, but you make it as close as you can to 1. And some other conditions, which I, I don't have time to describe, which allow special microstructures. And the materials that you get have incredible properties. In particular, the hysteresis involved in cycling the material above and below theta critical is reduced from about 70 degrees centigrade to 2 degrees centigrade. And at the same time, you get amazing uh, patterns of microstructure that change every time you thermally cycle the material. So here's a video, which I hope I can make work, which shows this cycling of the... So it's going, you're, you're increasing the temperature, that's austenite, that's martensite, low temperature. You increase the temperature, it's austenite, and you reduce it, it's martensite. Every time, it's a different microstructure. And we've never seen anything like this before. So we hope that this will um, have applications, uh, uh, technological applications, but this is uh, very new, very new stuff. And here's another interesting um, picture of a lambda two equals one alloy from a, a Japanese Tominari Inamura and there you see, again, a wonderful microstructure there, which seems to be, so in this case, it's cubic to orthorhombic, and it seems that the, 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 it's the, 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 the gradient of y in this grain in the middle there takes 12 values, none of which have rank 1 connection, so, it's, so you can't make an interface between them. So it's, an, it's a really... A, apparently an experimental observation of a very singular mathematical object uh, which you wouldn't maybe expect uh, to be possible. 
Okay, so now that's, that's, so that's all I've got to say on solid crystals. So now I turn to liquid crystals and, liqu and, and, and their defects. So liquid crystals are of many different types. You'll certainly have some on your wrist, or some of you will have some on your wrist or on your laptop. Um, they're the working substance of, of many computer displays. And the simplest uh, class, which I'm going to restrict attention to today, uh, is, is pneumatic liquid crystals. And many liquid crystals consist of rod-like molecules. Here are some space-filling models of two important commercial um, liquid crystals, MBBA and 5CB. And you see they're color-coded according to the atoms, so they're mostly carbon or nitrogen with a bit of oxygen and, and, and hydrogen. So, but they're not exactly rod, rods, but they, they're often approximated in, in mathematically by, by, by rods. So the, uh, the, the pneumatic phase uh, typically forms on cooling through some critical temperature, theta critical, by a phase transformation from a higher temperature isotropic phase. So in the, in the higher temperature phase, the, these rods are oriented ra randomly. Okay? But when you, when you reduce the temperature, they, 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 they form this pneumatic phase in which they're sort of roughly lined up, uh, not perfectly, but like sort of matches in a, in, in a matchbox. Of course, they're also moving around due to thermal, thermal uh, motion. So they have orientational order, but they're not, no positional order. So they, they're, they're not arrayed in a, in a lattice like they would be in a, in a solid crystal. And so typically there's a, this critical temperature, theta critical, and, and, a, and a lower temperature, theta m, and below that the material does something different. It, it changes into a different liquid crystal phase, or maybe it solidifies. And so, uh, for example, for MBBA, which was one of those molecules, the two temperatures involved are 17 degrees centigrade and 45 degrees. So there's this um, range in which you can see the pneumatic phase. And I want to show you a video of the pneumatic phase forming as you reduce the temperature. So this comes from a very nice Cambridge website where you can see all sorts of interesting things. So here we're reducing the temperature. So the black is the isotropic fluid. And you see the, the pneumatic liquid crystal forming. And you see these interesting patterns. And these patterns are, are, are defects, actually. on for a long time, so maybe I, I, I stop it there. But. Now, so I'm going to consider a, a pneumatic liquid crystal at rest with no electromagnetic fields. Electromagnetic fields are very important for liquid crystals, but they don't change the mathematics uh, much. So I, I'll, I'll ignore them for the purposes of this lecture. Filling a container omega, which is a bounded region with sufficiently smooth boundary. And the, and the classical model of uh, liquid crystals is the ozane frank theory. And so the, the unknown is a unit vector n, that give, which is called the director, belongs to the unit sphere, which gives the mean orientation of the molecule. So you can see that in this picture on the bottom left-hand corner. And so the energy is got by integrating a, a function w that depends on n and its, uh, its spatial uh, gradient. And here, here you see the, the form of the, the energy. So if you look at it, you see it's quadratic. All the terms are quadratic in the gradient of n. And one or two or two of them have an n. The ones with the k2 and the k3 have a, 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 an n as well as the gradient of n. Now, those, those constants, k1, k2, k3, and k4, are called the Frank constants. And they govern, govern different kind of configurations of the, um, of the liquid crystal. So splay, so when, you, when, when it looks like that, more or less. Twist, when it, when it twists. Bends, when it bends. And now, the, the, the last one is a little bit more complicated. That's so-called saddle splay null Lagrangian. And by null Lagrangian, I mean that if you integrate it, it has this special property that if you integrate it over omega, 
its value only depends on the boundary data of, or on, only depends on n on the boundary of omega. And this turns out to be, so that means that if you're specifying what n is on the entire boundary, then, then that part of the energy is a constant, and so you can, you can ignore it, but you can't always ignore it. Now, there are some important inequalities due to Ericsson that tell you when this w is bigger than or equal to zero. And so there they are on the bottom, k1 big equal to zero, k2 big equal to zero, k3 big equal to zero, and two other conditions. And we'll always assume the strict form of these where the bigger than or equal signs are replaced by strict uh, inequality signs. Now, uh, if you've been, uh, if you've not seen this before, you might have been puzzled. N and minus N are physically indistingu indistinguishable. The, the, the molecules maybe are not quite the same if you turn them over, but statistically they are the same. And so it's a bit funny to think of N as a, as a, as a, as a vector with a particular direction because reversing the direction is physically the same. So N of X is better thought of not as a, a vector field, but as a line field. So, so, so it's, it's, it's direction that's important. Uh, and the, so you, you, it's parallel to some line, if you like, through the, through the origin. And the set of such lines are called the real projected plane. And they can be represented by the matrix n tensor n. Uh, so you see that from n tensor n, you can recover n, but only up to, up to a sign. Now, this is a quite important issue, because if you have a smooth line field, it need not be orientable as a smooth field. So on, on the, in the picture on the right there, you see a smooth line field, a two-dimensional one, uh, so the, the line field has to go parallel to the indicated curves. And you see that there's no way of assigning a direction to it. Because if you, so on the, on the left of this, um, so it's the region outside some cylinder. So on the left, you see that you have a choice of either the arrows pointing to the right or to the left. So if you choose them pointing to the right, then as you go around the top, you find that you get some kind of conflict in the blue, in the blue region. At the, uh, at the bottom. So it's not possible in that case to, to give up, to, to orient the line field. And, and um, so that, that's, a, that's an issue which uh, has been um, discussed by my collaborator and I. Actually, in the case when omega is simply connected, uh, then, you, uh, then you can orient any line field which has uh, finite uh, energy. So here's the energy minimization problem. We want to find an N that minimizes the energy subject to suitable boundary uh, conditions. Of course, N is a, has to be a unit vector. And there are some important identities uh, uh, which, which, which you can work out here are two of them. So the, in, the, the second one is, says that the gradient of N squared is the sum of the squares of all the terms that you see in the ozane frank energy. So, if k1, k2, and k3 are all equal and k4 is zero, then from that second identity, you find that i of n is k1 over 2 times the integral of the gradient of n squared. And that's the so-called uh, energy function for uh, harmonic uh, maps. Now, an example of a, a point defect, I showed you a picture of point defects, is the so-called hedgehog, which is illustrated here. So that's n hat of x is x over the norm of x. So it represents, uh, it's pointing radially outwards uh, from, a, from, from a point. And of course, that's not continuous at 0. But away from 0, it's a smooth function. And you can calculate its gradient. And here's the calculation of the gradient. And you find that the gradient squared is 2 over the radius squared. So if you formally calculate the energy of this, this uh, hedgehog over the unit ball, you find that it's bounded above by a constant times the gradient of n hat squared. So you can write that as is equal to 4 pi times a constant times the integral of r squared. Then you put in the, 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 from, from the gradient of n hat squared is 2 over r squared. So you see it's finite. 
so this is this is a this point defect has finite energy according to the uh, Ozane proof. One thing, since I'm a mathematician, uh, so here's this very interesting theorem that the hedge that if k1 is less than or equal to k2, then uh, then n hat the hedgehog is the unique minimizer of the energy subject to its own uh, boundary condition. So so. Uh, here's a very fast proof of this that I found with Epifanio Vega. So the, actually the, the main idea comes from Feng Wa Lin in 1987. So the idea is you, you first note that the following inequality holds if K1 is less than equal to K2. So this is, you see, just like a, a, an ozone frank energy with particular constants. So instead of K2 plus K4, I've got 2K1. And so you can, you can I mean, that, that will be bigger equal to zero, bigger or equal to zero, if and only if the Erickson inequalities hold. And you find that indeed, that if K1 is less than or equal to K2, then the Erickson inequalities hold. Okay, so the Erickson inequalities imply this. And so now, you can ignore the saddle splay term because I've got fixed boundary conditions on the, on the boundary, so the, that just gives a constant. So here's the Here's the energy, I of n is a half sum of those three terms, which also appear here. So you use that inequality, and you find it's bigger equal to k1, the integral of div n squared minus the trace of red n squared. But that's a null Lagrangian. So that has to equal the value for the hedgehog. Right? And then you just check that that, that, that that expression is, in fact, the energy for the hedgehog. So you see it's really just almost a one-line proof that the hedgehog uh, minimizes the energy. We also have a fast proof that it's the unique minimizer, but I, but I won't um, show you that. So there's an interesting case of a singular, uh, a singular deformation uh, which represents a point defect that, that minimizes the energy in, in some circumstances. Now what about line defects? So you might, might think, well, why don't I have a two-dimensional hedgehog? So I have a a line, and then the then the director points radially outwards from the line. Okay, so then you can write down what the formula is, and you can calculate the gradient of, of this this vector field n tilde squared, and it turns out to be one over r squared. But now r is the two-dimensional radius. Okay, so then you try and calculate its energy, and you find that. Now uh, I'm integrating the integral of r times 1 over r squared, and that's infinite. So that's a worry, because sometimes you see this kind of defect, but according to the ozane frank theory, it has infinite energy, which is obviously not satisfactory. What's more, you find up, you see other line defects. So here's one, a so-called index one-half defect. So in this case, the at, at, at the point in the middle, that's a line going into the center of the screen, and, and, the, and the other lines show the direction of the line field. And, and they fail to be modeled by Ozane Frank for two reasons. First of all, they're not orientable. So again, you try to orient them, and you get some kind of contradiction. And the second reason that they, don't, they, they can't be described by Ozane Frank is that even if you look at just one of the sectors, the energy there is in more or less by the same calculation as I showed above. So now, th that problem could be resolved potentially by doing something that's heretical in the theory, but I don't see why you should do it, to modify the growth of W for large gradient of N so that instead of it being quadratic, it's subquadratic. That would give, that would give uh, things finite energy. But it won't solve the non-orientability um, problem. Now, there's something very interesting, independently of maybe liquid crystals or solid mechanics, which is called the Lavrentiev phenomenon. And what this says is that minimizers of the same energy functional in different function spaces can be different and give different values for the minimum energy. And so a consequence of this is that the function space is part of the model. And I wanted to show you some example where you can sort of see this uh, intuitively. It's an example from solid mechanics where you have a ball 
of rubber in, gr in, 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 in green, so inside the, um, the blue, the blue um, circle or sphere, and you're pulling it radially outwards uh, according to the, to the red arrows. And you model this according to nonlinear elasticity. I, I, I don't give you what the exact model is, but what I'm going to show you is what happens in different function spaces. So the function space is going to be along the line, and then I'll show you, and this is not a usual thing to do, but if you allow uh, n, the director, to be discontinuous. Okay, so then you have to augment the energy by paying an energetic penalty for uh, a jump in n. So here we, we work in this space, which I haven't defined, SVV, and so we have the energy that we had before, the integral of W of n greater to n, and then we have an integral over the jump set of n, so that's the set of points where n jumps, which is well defined in this funny space SPV. And then it's all, something else that's well defined is the normal to that jump set, which are, is written as new. And other things that are well defined are the two limits, n plus and n minus, on either side of the jump set. So we assign an energy to whenever you have a jump of n, which is some int, int, integral over that jump set, of some function of those three things, n plus, n minus, and nu. And here we consider a problem, it's called order reconstruction, it's been considered by many authors, in which we have two plates, uh, filled, and the region between is filled with liquid crystal. And on the top plate, the director has to be vertical, and on the bottom plate, it has to be horizontal. But the plates are very close together, they're distance d apart. And so those two boundary conditions are sort of antagonistic, right? So now imagine that, um, that N is smooth. Okay? Then it's got to go from horizontal to vertical in a distance D. So its gradient is going to be of order 1 over D. The energy is quadratic in the gradient. So the energy will be of, of order 1 over D squared. And then you have to integrate it over the volume, so you multiply by D. So the energy of a smooth deformation is of order 1 over d. It's like, in fact, c over d times l1 and l2, where l1 and l2 are the, uh, distant, the, other, the other two uh, distances. So that's what the energy looks like uh, when you have a smooth uh, n that goes from horizontal to vertical. But now suppose you allow n to jump. And then what you can do is to take, say, a capital N that is uh, plus or minus E1 up to, say, halfway, and then vertical. Right? So then you pay, the gradient then is zero. So you pay no elastic energy at all. And so all you have is the, is the energy of the surface, which is L1, where it jumps. So that's L1, L2 times some F of something. And of course, when D is sufficiently small, that's going to be less than C over D, L1, L2. So in fact, this, this problem prefers you to have an N that jumps. And, 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 and that sort of thing does happen at very small scales, it appears. And so here are another, some other possible applications. There are liquid crystal elastomers that are somehow a, a mixture of martensitic phase transformations and liquid crystals. And you get this layering, and in these layers, across the layers, you expect the, the, the director to jump. And then there's some very interesting things that have happen in thin films of smectic liquid crystals where apparently you get jumps in, in, the, in the director. And finally, there's a sort of mathematical uh, convenience that you could assign zero energy to a, a jump from n to minus n and thereby recover orientability uh, in, in these index one half defects. So finally, I want to say something about another theory, which is liked very much by physicists, which is the landau degen model. And this is, if you like, a smoother model. It uses, instead of the director, a tensor order parameter that's based on the probability distribution of molecular orientations at, or very close to, a, a point x. And, and two advantages uh, that people think of of this model over the ozane frank model is that it gives structure to defects so that in particular they have finite energy. For example, the, the line defects will have finite energy. And secondly, it resolves the problem of orientability of the director. So here, here's a kind of quick introduction. 
So in green is our region containing the liquid crystal. And then we take a point X, and we think of it as being a very small ball. Small enough to be essentially a point, but large enough to contain lots of molecules. So to give an idea of the numbers involved, if, if the radius of this ball was one micron, the ball would contain about a billion of molecules. So, uh, so easily enough for a statistical description. So now you imagine picking one of the molecules, like the one in light blue, from this ball, and looking to see what its orientation is. And that way you get this probability distribution, rho of x and p, so it's a probability distribution on the unit sphere that tells you the probability of, of getting a particular orientation for the molecule. Because we're working with this head-to-tail symmetry, it's going to be symmetric, rho of x p is going to be rho of x minus p, and of course it has to integrate up to one over the sphere to be a, to be a probability. And the first, so, so De Gen uh, thought, well, you can't really have this probability distribution as a state variable because it's, it's infinite dimensional. So why not instead work with moments of it? But the first moment is automatically zero uh, by this symmetry condition. So the, the, the first non-trivial information comes from the second moment, which is defined to be m of x, which is the integral of over the sphere of p tensor p against rho. And this is a positive definite symmetric matrix. And in the case when the distribution is isotropic, so that means rho of x p is 1 over 4 pi, then it turns out that m of x is 1 third times the identity matrix. So um, De Gen uh, uh, suggested that one should subtract a third the identity from m. That way you get a matrix which is symmetric and by construction its trace is zero. And what's more, because M is a positive definite symmetric matrix, the minimum eigenvalue of Q is going to be bigger than minus a third. So this is uh, an important constraint to make, uh, if you like, Q of X something physical. Now, uh, <coughs> people consider then a free energy that depends on this matrix Q and its gradient. And it's conventional to split it into two places, pieces. So first of all, you put the gradient of Q equals zero, and you get a C of Q zero. That's called the bulk energy. And then you have to subtract it off again. And so the remaining part that really does depend on the gradient of Q is called the elastic energy. And it's often assumed that the bulk energy has this quadratic form shown with A linear in the temperature and B and C are positive constants. And if you work out what the Qs are that minimize that energy, then they turn out to, be, to have two equal eigenvalues. You can represent them in the form Q is a, a, a constant S times N times N minus a third the identity, where N is a unit vector. S is given in terms of the, of the coefficients, A, B, and uh, C. Now, actually, it's better, in my opinion, to use uh, a different of C of B that blows up as the minimum eigenvalue goes to minus a third um, in order to preserve that constraint that the minimum eigenvalue is bigger than minus a third, um, which, is a, which is a physical one. But, and you get the same sorts of predictions, actually. Now, for the elastic energy, uh, it's usually assumed to be quadratic in the gradient of Q, and it has to satisfy some isotropy conditions that come from rotation and variance and so on, and four possible isotropic functions that are quadratic in the gradient of Q are shown. So these are summed over repeated indices. And what we assume is that the elastic energy is a linear combination of these four invariants, where the Li are material constants. So how do you get from one theory to the other? Well, since the bulk energy is minimized for these uniaxial uh, deformations, you can, where there is a unit vector n, you can think that in the limit of small elastic constants, the minimizers will be nearly uniaxial. 
So, so that this motivates a constraint theory in which you minimize I of Q subject to this constraint. So in that case, you have to minimize just the elastic energy. So you can put that Q into the elastic energy, and what you get is exactly the ozane frank energy, and the constants K1, K2, K3, and K4 are given in terms of S and the four um, constants L1 up to L4 through this invertible matrix. So you can go back and forwards from the Ki uh, to the uh, Li. So now, this is my last slide. Um, what's interesting is that, that under suitable conditions on the Li, minimizers of the landau dugen energy functional are smooth. They're smooth. They have no singularities. So, so here you see this contrast between a rougher model and a smoother model. The ozane frank theory is a rougher model, and it represents point defects as singular minimizers. It has some trouble with line defects, but at least with point defects, it represents them as singular minimizers. But the Landau Dugen model has no singular minimizers. So defects are not represented by singularities. So you have to think very carefully as to, as to how you see the defects according to the Landau Dugen model. And, and in fact, there is uh, you know, this relationship between the description of defects according to these two different models, one of which has the order parameter to be just a unit vector, which is, say, two-dimensional, and one which has this, the, the order parameter as this trace-free matrix, which has this sort of five-dimensional. Um, so the, you know, how, how is it that you describe uh, defects according to the two models? For example, how would you describe the hedgehog in the landau Dugen model? So there's a huge amount of interest and current research on this kind of um, uh, on this kind of question. So on, on one hand, you'd think that well, the the Landau Dugen theory is the better theory in some sense; it has more structure. But on the other hand, re really everything is uniaxial almost everywhere. So you would like a theory that that is uniaxial. But the ozin frank theory has these problems with giving some defects infinite energy and so on. So the question is, what what is the really the sort of the best way? of doing things. So that's, there you see in, in liquid crystals a contrast between uh, a rougher model and a smoother model. And, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't say anything about smoother models for Martensitic transformations, but these exist also. And uh, so, so you, can, you, can make a, you can add a term to the energy which represents the, 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 the surface and the interfacial energy of, of, of um, when you have a twin, which according to the elasticity model is a sharp interface, then you can smooth it out, and so you so so the, the twins are somehow smoothed in this in this smoother model, and so that that's also a, a sort of area of great interest how you how you um, how you see the connection between modeling the same sort of phenomenon, which in, in that case is is interfaces in in, in materials according to different theories which have different uh, degrees of um, complexity. So that's all that I, that I have to say. Once again, I, I want to express my appreciation uh, for the award of this prize, and I hope that it be something that I've said has been interesting for you. Thank you. Uh, what I have, I have really two questions. One, what is the main thrust of the theory of water? Is it preventing disaster effects of the defects, or is it uh, predicting the disaster? So that's the one. Another question is, uh, I think you almost answered it in the, uh, uh, next to the last lecture. All these coefficients that appear in different equations, 
are they universal in the sense that for each material they are the same? Uh, or they change from uh, one direction to the other. Okay, so, so and, the, uh, uh, the last one of these, I know uh, Okay, taking into account whatever the answer you ask for the two questions, how do the results, because we were talking about problems that deal, that are important to the industry. So how are the results correlating with actual happening of the these are all excellent questions. Now, so for, for um, Martin Siddig phase transformations, I mean, if you look at a knife or a fork or something and you look at it in a microscope, you see all these layerings and defects and so on. So, and, and they are absolutely crucial for the actual microscopic behavior of the material. So, there's no, you know, you open any journal in material <coughs> science and you see micrographs in where you see uh, a set, you know, usually more complicated than what I've shown, but um, it, it's absolutely vital. I mean, every material does this automatically. Every alloy does this automatically. So there it's, uh, it's a question of, um, the, the, there's no question of the defects being a disaster. They're always there. Now, for liquid crystals, it's a little different. Um, usually, you don't want the defects, uh, but uh, there are there are kinds of special displays. Uh, see, if you take a watch display or, or a uh, liquid crystal display for a computer and you turn off the current, then the picture disappears. But um, there are so-called bistable displays. Uh, which have the property that when you turn off the current, the picture remains where it is. Okay. Now, for those kinds of displays, defects can be very important in order to stabilize the, the picture, if you, if you like. Now, um, then you asked whether the constants that appear are the same. No, they're not. You can vary them. Uh, and they, they vary a lot. And, and, and actually, one of the outstanding questions, say, for liquid crystals is how to understand um, how, how the behavior depends on these constants. I mean, in a lot, a lot of um, scientific papers, they consider this one constant theory, which is very special and doesn't at all um, represent the full kind of range of uh, possibilities uh, that occur. Now, one of, the, um, one of the big issues, I think, that's a big scientific issue, not just connected with these two fields, is how you go from a molecular or atomistic theory to one of these continuum theories. And so that's a very, very complicated and difficult problem. And uh, it's because we don't really understand how to do that well that we have to make assumptions about the continuum theories, but we don't really know whether they're right or not. I mean, things like you know, the growth of, I mean, even just justifying that things should depend on, on, on gradients, for example, uh, and uh, justify, you know, trying to understand how fast these should grow when the gradients become very large, and so on. So these, these are all questions that come from um, that should come from a proper, a proper understanding of how you go from um, atomistic and molecular theories to uh, continuum theories. And at the same time, uh, you should, uh, I mentioned that it's not just a question of getting the energy uh, functional, it's also um, uh, a question of, of, of deriving the function space. And the function space should also, in some sense, come from this uh, process of going from an atomistic to a molecular, from an atomistic or molecular theory to a, a continuum uh, theory. Uh, 